Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. For this instalment, I speak with Hannah. She shares her experiences coming from the Philadelphia Church of God, an offshoot of the Worldwide Church of God. This is just another example of how cults birth cults, and so on. As usual, a quick bit of business before we start. For anyone who would like to, you can support my podcast through Patreon for as little as £1 a month. I also have an Android app called The Cult Vault on Google Play Store. If you have five minutes, please like, share and follow the podcast and leave a review if you can. This helps me hugely. I also have a second podcast called The Conspiracy Vault. Now, enough of business. Here is Hannah. Hi Hannah and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. We've been talking actually for I put I think probably the longest I've been speaking to anybody that I was um, hoping to interview. So I'm really excited that I finally get the chance to sit down and speak with you today. Um, for our listeners, it's something a little bit different that I don't think I've personally come across yet so I'm particularly interested in hearing your story and getting to know you a little bit more so would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely thank you for that wonderful introduction I feel <laughs> the pressure is on to be a, a fantastic <laughs> talkative guest. Um, my name's Hannah I'm 27 and I am a survivor of the cult known as the Philadelphia Church of God. Um, I think you and I have been speaking um, over Reddit since the beginning of the spring since mm -hmm. COVID started, basically? Yeah, it's been a long time, hasn't it? I, I go back through my messages and, and your, our initial conversation is always one of the ones at the very bottom, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, uh, which um, is strange, uh, but it's also exciting. It means that those first conversations I was having with people where I thought, you know, the podcast might not really go anywhere um and here we are and it's still going and it's still picking up momentum and people are still interested in coming to speak with me so uh i i'm i'm just excited i mean <laughs> but for people that aren't sure or haven't heard of the philadelphia church of god just explain to people a little bit about what that movement is of course, of course. So Philadelphia Church of God is an off branch of what is known as the Worldwide Church of God. Um, ha as people have looked up the Worldwide Church of God, it was started by a name, um, a man named Herbert W. Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And the sect of cults that broke out of the Worldwide Church of God, there are many, many different branches that broke apart, are all called Armstrongism. And so the PCG is probably one of the biggest off branches of Armstrongism. Uh, and basically they devout their um, founding and their college. They have an auditorium. They're, they're a, there's basically a compound in Edmond, Oklahoma, dedicated to Herbert W. Armstrong and um, his followers that followed uh, Gerald Flurry. Gerald Flurry is now the leader of the Philadelphia Church of God, was a minister in the Worldwide Church of God. When Herbert Darby Armstrong died, many ministers tried to take over that cult. There was almost right. 80,000 80, members, and so anybody would want to take over that power. And mm -hmm. instead of being uniform and unison, many people broke apart took P followers and started their own, on their own off branches. I think that's quite a common thing that I'm, I, I keep coming across in different denominations that have come out of, you know, the, the main overarching um, Christianity, Catholicism, uh, Buddhism. It seems to be that when a main person passes away, nobody can really agree on how the, or, or how things should move forward or how scripture should then be interpreted so they say well I'll just go and take this small group of people and do it my way and then somebody else says well I'm going to do the same and then before you know it there's so many new sects that it's hard to it's hard to trace back the lineage to where they originated from because worldwide church of god is also a denomination of something else it, it is called, it, basically, it's a dom denomination of Seventh-day Adventists. Um, mm -hmm. Herbert W. Armstrong kind of dipped his toe 
in Seventh Day Adventist and believing that the Sabbath day was on Saturday, much like the Jewish faith. And then he took that and 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 made it what it was, the Worldwide Church of God. Originally, it was called right. the Radio Church of God um, that he started in, I think, Eugene, Oregon, back in the 30s. Right. And then it became, a, a, it's kind of like a, um, a telepreacher today. His gathering over the radio got bigger and bigger and more people were convinced and it just grew to what it was when he passed um, being a worldwide church of God. <laughs> and how old is the leader of, of the movement that we're talking about today? It could, because it sounds like the, these things have been happening over a number of years. So I would I, say I feel like he must be old. Jim. Yes, Gerald Furry uh, would have to be in his late 70s, 80s. I don't know his exact birthday. Um, birthdays are not relevant in the cult. It's much like Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't celebrate um, many holidays that the normal public would do. In fact, if you were here in America, the only two holidays that you and I would have celebrated as I was growing up were going to be Thanksgiving and the 4th of July. We didn't have Easter, Christmas, anything like that. Nothing was celebrated except for those two public holidays right and you're you're 27 years old now and whereabouts are you talking to us from oh um the childhood i i was raised in the cult i was born into this so i had no other um what's the word i want to use uh perspective of okay. how life should have been lived other than uh be, than what i saw from the outside Okay, so you're you're born into this movement, and your parents are active members in the in the church at this point. Yes. Oh, I can go into that a little bit more to to give you background on that. So my father um, actually was a part of the Worldwide Church of God. He joined, or he was uh, watching Herbert W. Armstrong on his program, got interested in it, got. Uh, pulled into the movement, as you would say, and um, that was right after he died. So he came in right as where, like we said, people are trying to change rules, devise power, people are pulling away. It, it was a, a mess. And he saw that and he left. He got on a bus to Montana, met my mom on that bus, and they got married shortly thereafter. And they found a sect of that cult, the PCG, and joined thereafter. They were both baptized before I was born and so they were both fully involved and committed into the philadelphia church of god um okay. i was born in 1993 so by i know that i think it's 1990 that they started the okay PCG. and do you know of any key differences between the philadelphia church of god and the worldwide church of god so i would say that the worldwide church of god was more i mean i have no perspective being that i was never in there but from what i see it was a little bit looser in um, authority. People weren't as punished. Um, I don't know if they had the same um, cutoff rules that now apply to the PCG, whereas if a member left, they could no longer speak excommunication, basically. Right, yeah. Um, but I, I do feel that from what I've, I've seen and what I've researched into the worldwide, the Philadelphia Church of God is more severe in uh, those kind of outward, worldly connections, as they would call them. Right. Okay. And your parents have you in 93. Um, are there any other siblings that you have? I have three younger sisters and they are all still involved in the cult. Oh, they are. Mm -hmm. And, where, and do you, where do your parents stand at the moment? So my mother is who I'm with. Uh, she divorced my father, I think three or four years ago. And okay. my father is still in the cult and my mother has left. So of my whole family, me and my mother are the only ones who have been excommunicated. Okay, and was it because of the church that your mum decided to to move away from your father and kind of and 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 stop being a member of the church? So how I understand it, just because it's my mom and she only tells me the details that a daughter she would tell a daughter is yep. that um, she was not happy in her marriage. My father um, took to the man of the house ruling of the church mm -hmm. very seriously. So he was basically a dictator and required that my mom work full time, come home, make dinner, clean the house, and then do it all over again while he right. sat on a couch and watched TV all day. And so after 20 years of that, my mother was finally done. And the church does allow for certain instances 
of divorce, but in my parents' instance, the church wasn't going to allow my mother to divorce my father. And so therefore she left the church so that way she could get her divorce. Okay. And does that mean now that she is excommunicated or, or is it yes. different? Right. Okay. And so is she allowed contact with your sisters? No. And, and that's the same for yourself as well. Mine's a little different. I was never baptized into the church. Okay. I left when I, I was left when I was 16. My mother was baptized. So their ruling is, is that if you were baptized and blessed with quote unquote, the word of God, and you leave and you leave the word of God, then you, you cannot return. You cannot, you can return, but you can't communicate with members of the church. Right. And if, if, the Philadelphia Church of God is, is based in Philadelphia. Is that where you are both living now? No, 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 no. The Philadelphia part of the Philadelphia Church of God comes from a chapter in Revelation where it is the trumpets being, I, I, I don't read the Bible much. I'm just going fully off of memory, is that there is a chapter in Revolution where there are eras of the church um, kind of announced or labeled this era of the church will have this amount of truth but then they will go away this era of the church will have this amount of truth and they will go away and the very last era is called the philadelphia era and they're supposed to have the key of david which is the news program that the philadelphia church yes. of god puts out and they use that as the end time prophecy they're very much the world is going to end you need to be in this cult in order to survive it if you are in this cult, you will teach those who um, in the world tomorrow is basically what they call it. The world after Armageddon, where we will be teachers and kings and queens. And we will teach all the ignorant people who denied God's truth. They will get another chance to live God's truth and we'll be able to teach them. Right. So, so it, it, the Philadelphia Church of God that's not actually based primarily in Philadelphia, although there may be some members that live in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It's actually based out of Edmond, Oklahoma. And that is that where you are now? No, no, I'm in Atlanta. Okay, Atlanta, you're, in, you're in Atlanta. You're, you're right, you're in Georgia. And you mentioned the Armageddon. So do, mm -hmm. does this movement have sort of end of times oh, yes. uh, doctrines? Really. Is there a doomsday prophecy at all? Oh, yes. Um, I can actually remember specifically hearing... I was eight years old. It was Mother's Day weekend. We had gone to South Georgia to visit some friends and we were in a hotel room listening to the sermon and it was Gerald Flurry announcing what was called the last hour. And it was, we are in the last hour in God's time on this earth. And oh, he gosh. used that. Oh yeah. <laughs> and especially at eight years old, you're like, okay, my time's up. I've only got an hour. Um, and it was very, I mean, as an eight year old, that's, it's yeah, terrifying. that's terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was almost 20 years ago. So I think about five years ago, he started using the last half of the last hour. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it's I was I've actually been speaking to a lot of ex Jehovah's Witnesses lately. And one of the ladies I spoke to said that there's a joke within ex members that they always say that in the end times of the end times, because they've been in the end times for so long that they must now be in the end times of the end times. So um, that sounds a little bit similar to, to that as well. Um, exactly. exactly. And, that's, and that goes hand in hand with why when a cult leader dies, they have this off branch is because this whole time, this one guy has been saying, it, it's me and you, it's me and you, and then it's going to end. So when he dies and there is no end, mm -hmm everyone's like but what 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 do i do what happened that's, yeah exactly and oh no sorry we got the we got the mathematics wrong it's actually in another 100 years exactly and it, it it's kind of i don't know if uh, it happened over in england but in america i think it was 2010 some guy predicted that the world was going to end and everyone yeah. was pretending to lay out clothes on their lawn as if they had been raptured it was very funny it was very similar <laughs> Well, I mean, for people that are um, still living the reality inside these movements, I suppose that was probably quite terrifying in some ways. Um, oh, yeah. But, but Brainwashing for those of us on much. the outside, I think there's definitely some um, not 
yeah there's definitely some laughter to be had with those types of things people laying their oh, clothes yeah. out on the lawn but yeah well, brainwashing, brainwashing is a huge thing yeah and especially fear-based brainwashing um like just to get a little political we have trump who does this thing that's gaslighting yes pretends, <laughs> saying things that he did saying things and saying that he didn't say them like immediately after the, the thing he the just said sentence. though yeah <laughs> what, what I, and then i mean <laughs> hardcore trump supporters will then double down and said no he never said that he didn't say that and then you can you can watch the clip back and the news reporter I, will say oh so you just said that you know you're gonna do x y z <laughs> i didn't say that i didn't say that he and then the supporters will say no he didn't he didn't say that i just honestly <gasps> from what watching it from over here is it's 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 interesting but it's also <laughs> it's almost like oh you sit here and you go what how do people still listen to what he says but then we're exactly the same over here with our government and the, the things that our government say you know they say, say boris isn't the best oh <laughs> gosh they say you're not allowed to go uh, in lockdown you're not allowed to if you have s s signs of symptoms of the virus you must i self-isolate and then one of his key cabinet members gets in a car and drives halfway across the country with after testing positive for covid to go and stay with his par parents and uh oh, God. and <laughs> all the journalists wow. follow him to this other part of the country and they're like well what do you have to say about this boris and then he just says he was doing what any good parent would do. But then the rest of us are getting threatened with fines. So it's like, but you just said we're not allowed to do that. And now because one of your staff members has done it and made you look like an absolute idiot, you're saying it's okay. So yeah, I mean, ga gaslighting, brainwashing, it's, oh, and, and I, I, it's, especially with the election coming up, I imagine all the social medias and news outlets are just kind of throwing it's all it's, those it's, headlines and misleading headlines and all that all, almost propagating for uh, one yeah. presidential candidate to another yeah it's I'm, I'm almost ready to put on the back of my car i've survived 16 years in one cold please don't let me survive another four years in yours yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah i did a whole episode on on uh, QAnon and, and I'm, I'm interviewing a, a, a few people soon as well about their one person that was a, um, a, a, a Q member, hardcore Q believer, and one person who has kind of lost their entire um, family to people that are buying into the, the whole Q mm. narrative. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear how they bounce their conversation off of each other but um mm -hmm. i've just googled here <laughs> gerald flurry he is yes. classed on wikipedia as a tv mm -hmm. actor <laughs> sorry i'm so sorry <laughs> so <laughs> that's so really that's funny. how yeah that's how he's categorized on the internet as a, a tv actor he's 85 years old um i mean I guess whoever wrote that Wikipedia page on him doesn't believe what he is proselytizing on the TV. No, and and I'm really I I'm, I don't watch. I don't know. His son, his name is Stephen Flurry, has really taken over kind of the frontward facing of the cult, the public oh, yeah. eye. Yeah. So they started a magazine called the Philadelphia mm -hmm. Trumpet News Magazine. And yep. he is his son, Stephen, is the executive editor. So mm -hmm. is that is that magazine a little bit like the watchtower that the Jehovah's Witnesses have? Like exactly. something that is right, okay, okay. So have you ever been told to read one of these magazines? Oh, I oh, they have literate like the magazines is one thing. They have doctrine books, probably twenty or thirty different titles of books that what Gerald Flurry wrote that Herbert W. Armstrong wrote that I was forced to read. Did I read them? No, but I was forced to sit in my room with only that book and to sit there for two hours and see how far I could get in. Which right, right. Did. So do you think that um, your sisters now are being encouraged away from, you know, worldly fiction writings and more towards things that the flurries have written um, and I'm, read in the news magazines? 
as far as fiction goes, they do have a kind of policy of like no witchcraft. I wasn't allowed to read the Harry Potter books. I wasn't allowed to read The Hobbit nor watch the movies. I don't know what people have against Harry Potter. It seems like every religious organization is... It, it, I don't it's, get it. It's specifically Harry Potter, though. And see, here's the best part. So I moved in with my grandmother in high school, and she was a fifth grade teacher. So she had all the books. She read all the books. <laughs> and this is when the movie started coming out. So I mm-hmm. think it was seven part one had just come out right and she wanted and she wanted to go see it and I didn't have anywhere else to go so she took me with her and I swear to god I was so confused I never read a book I'd never seen a oh movie my they're goodness. talking about muggles and I'm like muppets what are what? they doing <laughs> and I was so confused so confused and so I kept asking her questions and she kept shushing me in the middle of the movie and Finally, we get out and we get home and she just hands me all the books and I finished the first book in a night. Wow. It, 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 I don't understand why a cult would be against that. It's, it's so nice. It's so, such good books. <laughs> were you, you were still an active member of the church when you were reading the books? No, 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 no. I had, right. I, at that point, if I can talk a little bit about my exit process, um, my parents, I quit going to church, still living with my parents at 16 right. or 15 going on 16. I had been in public school. I had the internet and I did exactly what you just did. I Googled Gerald Furry and I could see all of these ex-member um, talking about ministers that I knew, talking about members that I knew and their experiences. So being 15 with Google, I figured out that I was in a cult and truly I never believed anything it was a struggle for my parents to get me to pray it was a struggle for my parents to get me to comply with any policies or actions that the church wanted me to do and to see this and to see i don't have to do anything this is a cult they basically told me that i was either going to go to juvenile hall or i was going to go live with my grandmother so i went to live with her and she's she's a lot, like then giving you all these Harry Potter books to read and, and yeah she no other part of my family is involved in a cult whatsoever no right, other right. part of my family is even religious I don't have family that goes to school or to uh, church every Sunday I don't have any family that does anything like that so, so do you yeah. did you ever have any big family get-togethers or did you did your family kind of isolate themselves <sighs> away from from those things because I imagine that would be very strange you know if people are drinking alcohol and so alcohol you know was, lot, okay. lots of food oh okay alcohol is okay yeah dr- drugs tobacco drugs alcohol they they encouraged they they said i mean they would drink wine in certain ceremonies I and mean, not like catholicism where you take the cracker and drink the blood but right right i mean they, the, the alcohol was not forbidden whatsoever right okay okay it was more so of the Saturday, so for instance, on Saturday, Friday nights at sunset, you were not allowed to do anything, much like the Jewish Sabbath. Once sunset hits, you're not allowed to do anything. You can't work, you can't make. So everything was supposed to be clean, everything was supposed to be spotless. You go to church on Saturday morning, and then the Sabbath is over on sunset Saturday night. Okay. And when you were um, younger and active in the church um, and your, both your parents are active in the church, what, what did the average day and week look like for you in terms of the responsibilities that you and your family had to commit to church activities? So church, unless it was a holy day season, what we call it, um, was really only on Saturdays. Um, we didn't go to school. We weren't public schooled until later in life. My mom homeschooled us to prevent us from any quote unquote worldly influences. So we would homeschool, we would pray, she would try to put the religious doctrines into our school daily life. Um, it affected how we dressed, it affected how, what we ate. Um, much We did a kosher diet, much like the Jewish religion no pork, no shellfish, um, no gelatin, things like that. I didn't have marshmallows until I was 16, 17. Um, dress code, no makeup, you couldn't show your knees in a skirt, shorts had to be past your fingertips, nice. no bosoms could be showed, and that was the biggest shameful thing, is I'm naturally blessed up front, and so <laughs> 14, 15, I mean, you can't, you can't hide it, it's going to be there, 
and I was getting shamed by ministers saying you that's, need to cover yeah, that up. I mean, that's difficult because firstly, like if, if they're noticing, then it's kind of their problem. And secondly, mm -hmm. why are you looking um, at a 15 year old gold tits, bro? Yeah. And, and then on top of that, you know, it's not something you can change. It's not like you've put makeup on your face and you can easily remove that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a part of you that, you know, you can't, I can't control. You, you can't just take them off and be like, Oh, there you go. Problem, problem solved for you. Cause it's mm -hmm. not a problem for me. So yeah, very, very frustrating. Very, very it was very, very, um, masculine uh the men are the leaders right um i don't know much as far as how the uh, headquarters operated but from the few people that did go to the college and did live at headquarters it's very sexist in the fact that men could own property and they could live on campus for free but the women could not right and 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 men could do certain jobs and only women could do certain jobs and men are the chancellors and the ministers women are meant to be the wives and that's it so to your knowledge are there any women within the church that would lead sermons or no services? no 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 women are the only time a woman would be on stage to during a service would be to perform what they called special music to sing that's it. Right. No, no woman is allowed to conduct um, songs, hen singing. No woman was allowed to do a sermon. Sermon that that is not allowed by the cult whatsoever. And this is what you were talking about before, when you know, because your your father seemed to have bought into this um, this view quite literally and strongly. Mm -hmm. And this is what mm -hmm. your mum, you know, be became fed up with eventually exactly and and to my knowledge I've, I've i keep in touch with people who have also left i actually was hanging out with a couple um two weeks ago and they've only left recently three years ago and they grew up in the worldwide church of god and then moved directly to the pcg so they right. had no, they're adults they're in their 50s and they've never been inside the real world up wow. until three years ago that must be a huge adjustment that must be so strange and and it, it is very it was i mean i was fascinated we probably talked for five hours about what they realized and how lax they were and how i talked to them about their relationship because they're still married and how he never took those rulings literally there was never that i'm the king you're below mm -hmm. me kind of concept where that was 100 percent with my father yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Because we're in the Western world and this is the 21st century and w women have had to fight so hard to, you know, just I even in the last few years for equal pay. Um, equal everything. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of think good, good for your mum. Good for her <laughs> I, for standing I, up and saying, you know, this is not, this is not a life. This is just me kind of um yeah. providing for you and you mm -hmm. not really it it's difficult isn't it when it's take 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 because i know that some cultures and some movements people will grow up and be like well i'm happy doing it because i'm that's what i'm supposed to do that's my purpose um but i don't know um as somebody that's never been put in that position i can imagine willingly remaining in 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 a position like that so i kind of can see why your mom did it and it's like woman power exactly and 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 she didn't grow up in a, a cult either she didn't grow up religious whatsoever um my grandfather was a surgeon and very well educated very well rounded um was not in any way going to let his daughters and his son only think through the bible he encouraged education and reading and for my mom to fall back from growing up like that in the 60s and the 70s which was not really popular she was given such an opportunity to grow without these bases or these biases and to fall back to marry my father and to join this cult and to fall so far far back in line with what this cult was preaching that women do and what my father was making her do is heartbreaking for me 
And I'll never yeah. forget the day when she called me and she said, I'm leaving your father and I'm leaving the cult. I was driving home and I pulled over, I was on the highway and I pulled over and just bawled. Cause I, at that moment, I was the only one outside of the cult of my entire family for eight years. So that was probably a, a bittersweet phone call for you to, to receive. Cause obviously oh, that, that comes it was with the sweetest. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, I guess I was thinking in terms of, you know, your, your mum your mum's decided to leave her marriage um which could not have been an easy decision to make especially with your sisters um and but then you you get your mum back which is which is great isn't it I mean yeah it it, it I see what you're saying it is bittersweet but I I her hap, my my best saying is the only way you can be happy is if you do it yourself there's nobody in this world who's going to make you happy unless it's you. Yeah. If you're not yeah. happy, you, you can't make anybody else happy. And I told yeah. her that she was not happy. She was going straight to bed. She didn't want to see anybody. She was severely clinically depressed. I trying to go to this cult, trying to make her marriage work, trying to be happy. Uh, I knew that it was going to be the happiest for her. And, and, and it did affect my sisters. I had, um, if I can go by numbers, just because I don't want to give their names, mm-hmm. um, number uh, two, three, and four. Number two um, is the one that got recently got married. Um, she didn't have anything to say. She didn't speak to my mom to my wedding last year, and hasn't spoken to her since wow. then. After that, that is that must be heartbreaking. That must be difficult. But at the same time, it's like you said. You know, you you, you have to look at the the can the condition and the happiness and your personal well-being and decide whether it's worth sticking around in a situation where you you think differently to everybody else because your mom obviously didn't believe in the doctrines and the prophecies and the the services if she walked away um, and I, 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 and it's difficult to maybe even to talk to your sisters if they are if they really do buy into it to have those same conversations. Um, I I think at one point it kind of, I, it's kind of like a like you're really really into a, a band and you love everything and you buy all their albums and you're so into it and then somebody leaves the band and it kind of teeters off. I would say that's exactly how my mom's reaction to the church was. She got into it. She had questions that the cult answered as far as why Christmas, why this, why that. And she got very obsessed. And then I left and was happy. Um, I had a little bit of relationship in college with them uh, after leaving. And she kept questioning me. Don't you believe you're going to go to hell? Don't you believe that this? Don't you believe that? And I told her that doesn't make me happy. That scares no. the shit out of yeah, me. Of and course. it's not true. And, and I think, and she tells me, and we had this conversation recently, that that was her encouragement to leave is because she saw how happy I was out. Wow. That's I, great, I was isn't never, it? Yeah, I was never happy in this cold. I was suffering. I was so miserable. I was suicidal. I did not want to be in that family. I did not want to be in that house. It was awful. And I finally got out and I've never been happier. And just to go back quickly on something you mentioned yeah. about your, your sister being married. Um, mm-hmm. d- so she's married to a, a member of the Philadelphia Church of God. Yes. She, she and um, number two and number three are both baptized, which means now they're eligible. When you're baptized, you're now eligible to be married. Right. Um, and so she got baptized and married a guy who I, I've met once, but that's it. And did she... Did she choose this spouse for herself? It was uh, ministerially approved. Right. So not not technically arranged. That's not the word I would use. But it's it's almost encouraged like, oh, that you'd be a nice fit. Not necessarily. It's more so um, two people come together. They go on a few dates and then they go to the minister to see if the minister approves of them proceeding in their relationship to marriage. And how do the, how do the dates work? They have to be approved by the ministry as well. So I'm, I'm only speaking out of what I know just because I didn't get to that stage. I guess from what, what I understand from people who did get to that stage and I went to the headquarters for summer camp one year. And so you 
get to meet all of the college campus um, kids, yeah. all the students, all the facilities. So their policies are also kind of presented to you. So how I understood dates to start off with is if you're not baptized, you're allowed to go on group dates where it's multiple boys and girls all together doing an activity. Once you're baptized, that's when you can start doing one-on-one -on -one and it has to be I don't know that it's supposed to be supervised or if it's supposed to be on campus, but what I know is that there is not to be any sort of sexual content um, right. contact until after marriage. Right. Okay. And does that include things like kissing? Cuddling? So kissing, they have this weird um, predecent set by Gerald Flurry that he never kissed his wife until they got married, which okay. I think is total bullshit, but whatever. Um, I don't think people follow that. I I was kissing boys behind dumpsters at twelve, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it it's it's one of those things where it's sometimes it's up to them and how shameful they want to be. But I don't think that like making right. out or heavy petting or groping, none of that. I think a simple peck is allowed. They're allowed to do right. Okay. So, have any of your sisters had? To children and started their own families no i i'm i'm the oldest so she just got married um in march and right, if there okay. is any if there's anything on the way i would probably be the last you know right okay okay so if your sisters do start their own families then they would be like almost like second generation philadelphia church of god babies yes which that would be that would be the second generation is it, it's interesting and, and i wonder if that's how if that's one of the main ways of retaining numbers oh for sure but they're gonna have to get something new because in the next two years everybody's going to be related so they're either going to have to make incest oh, allowed that's or creepy isn't it that oh Mm -hmm. it's it's very creepy that's yeah that's a bit that's very strange what about yeah. what about numbers in general do you have a rough idea of how many members that the, the the church overall claims to have so if, from what i remember you know, i'm i'm talking to probably 20 2004 2005 Mm -hmm. I want to say that their member base was between seven and eight thousand worldwide. Okay, okay, okay. So it does. So it not, does. It's not, not just American based. It does actually. No. There are members throughout different countries. There's actually a campus in England. It's called Edinburgh. People keep telling me that th these religions have like bases over here, and I just don't. I, I just ha I've never come across one of them yeah mind you i walk past a church and i just assume that it's just a church it could be a synagogue so it could it, be you know, and, and another thing is how they keep their money is i when we went to church it was not in a building like there, like there's a baptist church up the street saint john's baptist or whatever there was never a facility other than the headquarters in edmond oklahoma and now they're the one in england where the philadelphia church of god's name was on it if we met anywhere for church services on the weekly basis it was going to be a hotel convention room somebody's house a campground something along those lines because right that's what the tithe money funded was to pay for these little rooms because you can't pay for millions and millions of buildings across the world for 15 20 members in a state so that's how they operated. And and that's how many people you had in your particular congregation? So the Atlanta congregation, when I was little, let's say like six or seven, there were probably around 60 members. Um, as I got older, there were probably 40. And then we moved to Louisville for a little bit, which is where I ended my affiliation with the cult. And there were probably less than 20 and my family being six of them. And, and you mentioned that you went to one of these buildings or places of, uh, to meet on Saturdays. And, mm -hmm. and 
did you have any other responsibilities or did you take part in any other activities? Like, was there like a church choir or did you, were you part of a music group? So for, um, not because the congregation is so small, everything comes out of headquarters. So the special music in between services, all of that was sent on CDs to all the congregations. That's how they got the message out. Um, as far as duties go, it was just kind of cleaning up like a lion's club. Um, I'm trying to think of something. Yeah, um, we have lions over here. So that I do understand. Yeah. So basically we would rent out a lion's club for a Saturday, set up our little uh, lectern, um, little flower arrangement, set the chairs, set the audio. The women, if we had snacks, the women, that's what the women would do was the snacks for tidying up. The men right. would do the, the setting up and everything like that. Okay. And then after church was over, they made a policy where you have to smash the CDs because their sermons were getting released into the right. public, which they did. They did not like. And then you would clean up and that would be the end. Hang on. You come go, back next go back to that point. You're smashing CDs so that the public couldn't see what they were talking about. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But, so they, they wanted their core messages to, to remain a part when, of the the P, pc pcg family yeah there you go um yeah they they wanted they wanted their core messages to remain within the philadelphia church of god but they didn't want the public to know what those messages were mm -hmm. that's um, strange I, that's strange because usually people are like come and listen to the message we have the true message we have the true word um we have the word of god and uh, come and come into our congregation and listen to what we oh, have to say. Oh, no, 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 no. The Church of God was not an open door policy. That's if so, you, especially because he has a, a TV show as well. So if, if I can talk about the kind of indoctrination and getting it, getting to services policy. Obviously right. I okay. Never had yeah, to. absolutely. So how I understand it being that I never had to do it is that someone say like my father starts watching those programs like he did with Herbert Armstrong starts watching them they start talking about how much love all this and love bombing another form of brainwashing mm -hmm. and if you want the truth read these books and if you read the books they have these little things if you have more questions please call a minister and they start to call the minister and so the ministers would actually go out to people's houses and conduct what they interviews to see if they were um qualified like, yeah like viable candidates exactly. oh that's strange it's like being vetted for a job interview when you don't know that you're that Stephen that, Fleur, no Stephen weird. Fleury I will never forget um being at Philadelphia at the camp so the camp is called PYC Philadelphia Youth Camp um they called it PYC SEP Philadelphia Youth Camp Summer Education Program which is genius because you get all the teenagers in the cult to go into a month-long brainwashing session right before they go back to school. So they got everything kind of really grained in before they go back to public school with all their friends. And at that um, camp, the ministers, Flurry, Stephen Flurry, would give little lectures. And Stephen Flurry, I'll never forget, said, I interviewed a guy, he was covered in tattoos, and he's crying because now he can't get into the church because he's covered in tattoos basically freaking us out saying that we won't be allowed to be in God's kingdom because if we get tattoos. So it's just it's all very strange, isn't it? I mean, no, trust me, your reaction is, is very common. <laughs> did you, did you ever like, did you ever have services or meetings with Gerald or his son? Because if, oh, your yeah. if your parents came like from the, from the main, well, if your father came from the Worldwide Church of God into Gerald's denomination, then, mm -hmm. then even though he has a TV show and obviously speaks to yeah, hundreds. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, what did his house yeah. look like? Uh, 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 um, somebody who has way too much money and too much time. Um, <laughs> that's the basis uh they would travel like to 
all of our congregations. Um, I don't, he, they never came to the Louisville one because it was so small, but I do remember uh, at least twice him coming to the Atlanta congregation in person and people, I mean, it was like the Beatles came to town. It was crazy, but Gerald Fleury is on that um, kind of compound in Edmond, Oklahoma. Um, what I remember, uh, his wife had already passed, so upstairs was just a giant study with pictures of Winston Churchill and all these historical and religious documents. I mean, it's all just a facade. None of it, probably half of them never been opened, but it's what you would think a cult leader's house looked like. It's not extravagant. It doesn't look like the Prince of Persia or anything like that, but definitely more comfortable than 80% of what his followers have. And does he, do, do they, would they have people around for meals or, or, or were they ever invited to your home for the meals and, and like evening dinner time and things? So I don't, I don't have any memory of them coming to our house and eating. We did host um, Holy Day festivals. For instance, there's one called The Night to Be Much Observed, where basically everyone just eats a very fancy dinner. And we hosted that one time. And our okay. local ministers, our local ministers would come all the time. They, I would consider Gerald Fleury and Stephen Fleury to be the the heads they are the heads of this cult whereas the ministers are the local authority and we were more involved with them right okay okay and you've spoken a little bit about um you know um your mental health suffering during your time within the church and um and you know and 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 despite only having um saturday's um services you were almost overwhelmed by the your family's commitment to the church and and just not wanting to be a, a part of it anymore do you think that a lot of that comes from the the discipline that you were receiving within your family household that might have had something to do with it i i've just never like i said i've never for one second thought that any of that was true from right. childhood it just all seemed like a fairy tale it didn't make it was never logical to me it just seemed it was always weird it felt weird um definitely because of that and my rebellion towards trying to follow um church policies and whatnot um, my father did retaliate um through physical punishment but uh good and the types of discipline that were used in the home was some of them taken from the types of discipline expected within the congregation as well in terms of things like shunning yes um i will say the cult definitely 100 percent uh advocated for spanking in fact i remember right. a letter from a late uh, minister named marvin campbell who said that you need to spank your daughter and I'm five. I'm five. Yeah, that's that's horrific. I'm, that's absolutely. I'm mm -hmm. And it it only progressed. I mean, to just to talk about the abuse. So my father started off with a hand, as any normal adult does. Then it, from the hand, it was a book. From the book, it was a belt. From the belt, it was a two by four. Or no, it was a switch. Gosh. I don't know if you're familiar with a switch. No, like a little, no. A small, it's a small branch off of a bush that you remove all of the, oh, um, gosh, all the twigs. So you just have a long kind of whip like um, stick and he would use that. And then it was two by fours that he had turned into a handle much. I don't know if fraternities, um, fraternity paddles, if you've ever oh, seen gosh. those. Yeah. That's so awful. yeah. One of the last sessions of his um, corporal punishment, he broke that paddle on me oh my goodness yeah and this is encouraged by the church encouraged. itself mm -hmm. and the, the very last time my father did get put out for the, the final um kind of blow uh, i hadn't brought something home from school and he thought i was being disrespectful so instead of doing whatever a normal parent does to an, a 13 year old girl ignore her attitude um he decided to punch me in the face Oh, gosh. Uh, um, he dragged me up a flight of stairs by the hair of my head. 
he whooped my bottom so bad that I had bruises down my thigh to the back of my knees. Oh my goodness. And they wouldn't let me go to school for two days because they were afraid of that because I had gym class. If I put shorts on, they'd have seen. So, I mean, in what religional sense is that what God wants for his children? God wants to save those who are trying to leave the cult. I just don't, I don't understand the, <laughs> how people can justify a, the, the levels of abuse. I mean, that, that physical abuse is just, that is just absolutely horrendous for a 13 year old girl to then have to go to school and, and have gym and explain to people or try to, or try to ignore you know, people, I told them that I fell downstairs. See, this is horrible. How how can people justify that 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 level of abuse? And then, you know, this is we're just talking about one instance of of mm-hmm. of you being subjected to these awful things. And if it's encouraged okay. by the people who are active members of the church and dedicate their lives to the church and its message, how many more people is this happening to? Oh, I I can't I. I do not, I can't tell anybody stories because they're not my stories to tell, but I know for a fact that several of these ministers are domestic abusers who's punched their wives because their wives have no, they have no control. The men are supposed to be the leaders and the wives are supposed to be obedient. And so if you show disobedience, you are going to get that punishment is how I understood it and how I saw it. I saw another family that we were very close to. I mean, he, there, this is the same kind of family concept. There were four children, two boys, two girls. And I saw this father do awful things. It's say awful things, threatening his children. How, uh, who, who, who holds these men accountable? If there is, if, if, if the women are seen as objects rather than people, if they are seen as, um, you know, as people under the head of the family being the man, who holds the men accountable? If it's encouraged by the ministry for these things to happen, if the ministers themselves are carrying out this type of behaviour, there, there's nobody to, I don't know, there's, there's no... So the ministers are the ones that are supposed to be accountable. Now, I will say that event that where I had my, the ministers did um suspend my father right okay for um a a few months which was probably worse in my case because I got even more verbal abuse um for instance one of his friend's wives passed and instead of being mournful for his own actions that got him suspended from because if you're suspended you're it's kind of pre-excommunication you're not supposed to talk to anybody you're supposed to reflect on why you've been suspended and then repent and the ministers will will uh, say when you can come back so instead of repenting and thinking about how he almost could have killed me he decided that he was going to blame me for the fact that he couldn't speak to his friend because his wife died so that kind of guilt was also put on me at 13 14. It's my fault that I got beat up so bad by him that it's my fault. I cannot believe that these things are happening all around the world to people in all these different groups. I mean, it, it's, it's a good thing it's that you're here but to be able to speak to me about these experiences now in a reflective manner, you know, to be able to say that Absolutely. these things were happening to me and now I'm in a place where, you know, and I'm, of course you have your mum you can speak to about all of these things as well. Did, mm-hmm. did, did you speak to your, you know, your larger family members who weren't involved? Were they able to help you through these experiences? Oh man, you're going you're gonna to make me cry. <laughs> so um, it's just an emotional tale. Of course. Big rest. So... Uh, my grandfather, who is the doctor, who um, helped my family so much financially. Um, he supported my family, um, my mom and my dad, while my father was trying to go to school. And he didn't retire. He, he stayed off of retirement for 
three or four years just so he could support my family because my father couldn't keep a job. And I really wasn't close to that family. My father made sure to ostracize my mother from her family. And it really had an effect on us as children that my father's parents were the better grandparents and my mom's parents were the, were the worst grandparents. They weren't nicer or whatever my father would put out in the world. Right. And um, I finally got to have alone time with them when I was 19. Um, I went down, they live in what's called the villages, and I was able to sit down with them and tell them, tell them everything. They had no idea what happened to me. And we just cried like a family. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's a heartbreaking memory. Um, he since passed. And he didn't get to see my mom leave the cult, which is the one thing he wanted was for my mom to leave my father and to be happy again because he knew how unhappy she was. And I think that's what took my mom to leave was my grandfather passing. But it was, um, my, they had no idea. My sisters were still living with my parents since my grandfather called CPS. He tried to do everything he could to see if he could get my other sisters from out of that house. And yeah, it sounds, uh, it sounds as if, um, they had um, no idea. It, it, it definitely does sound as if child protective services w- would need to be involved in some kind of intervention with you mm-hmm. while you were younger it, it's it's all good and well the church suspending your father for a few months but it, it you know what are I mean that that type of trauma stays with you for a lifetime um mm-hmm. and and I know that it's when when parent when grandparents pass away they're like they're like your best friends because your your parents have to keep you on the straight and narrow and they can't they can't talk to you like they're your friend because you know they they have to be they're responsible for you and they have to make sure that you're you know they have to getting, be an authority yeah exactly and they if you're if if you're best friends with your child or as a parent you know if you tr- if you try and be best friends with your mom and dad they then they then the boundaries get distorted Word. and the mm-hmm. kids start to push at those boundaries and start to to play up and things but grandparents don't have that you you they're your bestest friends and you get uh, I was so close with my grandmother and I know it must be difficult for you to think about your grandfather and how he wanted to see your mum leave but at the same time think about how happy and wholesome it must have been for him to have that time with you after you know you decided to to move away from the church and you know, and go to your grandparents and realize that they're not these awful people that your father had told you. They're like two really cool people that will take you to see Harry Potter and you can, you know, build a new friendship and relationship with these awesome people. So you have to remember as well how warm he must have felt, how how happy he must have been in his heart to have that relationship with you. Oh, yeah. One of the final things he told me was how proud and how strong how proud of he was of me and how strong I was he 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 just graced me with so many compliments of how even though all the crummy things that have happened to me he he just was so proud and that's that's the greatest thing yeah I mean that's that's how people should be you know family members should love you unconditionally um you know it shouldn't be I will love you if you do right by your church you know you you can't put conditions on on things like that and and it sounds to me like that's what you got with your grandparents you know you've got that unconditional love and and appreciation and happiness um and with these stories they're often especially stories that include you know the types of abuse that you've spoken about they're often so heartbreaking and harrowing that we have to take the small bits of goodness that we can find Otherwise, it's just so depressing. And of, of course, you would end up suffering with your mental health. Absolutely. Especially uh, saying that you were the blame for the abuse. So I, yeah, you, you are the reason that you're getting abused. And, <laughs> like you that. know, that type of gaslighting that you can, you know, I, I imagine there are still times where you do something, you know, or something happens to you and you think to yourself, well, I brought that on myself. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. We, me and my therapist have been 100% um, trying to attack that. And it's, and it's difficult for anybody out there who is experiencing something like this. I encourage you, please seek out therapy. Please, please talk to somebody. You are not alone. That's the number one thing I want to get across is my story is my story, but there are millions like it. People who have had worse things happen to me. I mean, I'm I'm lucky enough to say that there was nothing sexually abused to me, and I'm 100% certain that there are others out there who can't say the same thing, and that I only wish for them to feel um, valued, to feel loved, and to know that this is why it's not your fault. None of this was your fault. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Seek help. absolutely. And I mean, you know, I've I've been having interviews every day this week, and. Um, what you've just said there is is pretty similar to what other victims and survivors have been saying as well. You know that you you you, you aren't alone in these situations, um, and you feel alone, but you yeah, are alone. Absolutely, absolutely. So moving away from the heavy stuff for, for a little yeah, while. Yeah, let me, let me um, cheer up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, when you were homeschooled, did you, did you still have any sort of childhood friends that you would, you know, go, go play out with? Or, you know, were your, your sisters, your friends growing up? Uh, a little bit of both. So outside friendships, outside the church, were not encouraged. Um, my friends made sure that I didn't give my friends in the neighborhood. I didn't have friends on the other side of town. It was just the neighbor kids or who was in my neighborhood um, and then my sisters. So obviously my parents would make sure that uh, to limit my amount of time with worldly kids, um, especially around Christmas, that they would basically not let me outside because um, I believe my parents got uh, for anybody out there, this is a Santa Claus uh, spoiler. <laughs> um, I was telling kids Santa Claus isn't real at five, which oh for my some goodness. parents, some parents are going to kill my parents. <laughs> and um, that's that's how they had to play it because they live in the world. We have neighbors. I'm a child. You're. I'm gonna say what you're. You t- you tell me. And I'm going to tell it to other kids who keep saying that they're going to get Santa Claus. So I know for a fact my parents got chewed out by neighbor kids. And that probably also had some effect, too, that neighbors didn't want us playing with their kids because of what my parents were doing or how we acted. Um, I did have friends in the church, but I would only see them on Saturdays at services. Sometimes we would go out to dinner after services, but really my, my time with them was limited to Saturdays after church in which you can't really play like a kid because you can't scream you can't run you're supposed to be tidy and quiet the Sabbath and did you have any hobbies or interests um out outside of the church do you know did you pick up an instrument or did you go to any other clubs so not really um I did do swimming I was on a swimming team uh when I got to public school I joined band I played tuba um which is after my grandfather my grandfather was in a jazz band and he plays tuba and I actually have his tuba in my living room now um college I want to say snowboarding but really all of that was I couldn't do anything on Saturdays so when I joined high school and was still playing tuba I had to quit band because in order to be a band in high school you have to be a part of the marching band and football games or American football games are on uh, Friday nights so I wasn't allowed to go so a lot of a lot of schools clubs things like that are on Saturdays Friday nights so that was really um not worth it my parents weren't going to spend money if half of the games were going to be on Saturdays and I couldn't right yeah yeah and I mean, if the church is as patriarchal as we've spoken about, I'm guessing there's no place for the LGBT community within the congregation. 
sorry no that is strictly not allowed though it's man and a woman period um if okay you come out as if you come out as any kind of gender queer um tra- trans anything you are immediately out that's and you're, you're not coming in i mean you mentioned that you were caught looking at that type of explicit material one time as well. Oh yeah, I'll tell that story. Um, So essentially being a curious child, I never knew what lesbian sex looked like. So I Googled it and it was pretty interesting. Now I will claim that I am a bisexual woman and I'm very happy with it. Um, My parents found the, the history and basically made me go through a really an embarrassing process of when we had ministers, not every week was a minister present at church. So if we did have a minister, that was going to be the week that people would talk to him for counseling in person or for whatever reason. So we had a counseling session, which means you go into a private little area. They had these um, steel PVC rods that they would screw up and make a little curtained room anywhere we went. So that way you could have a private session with the minister. And basically went into a room like that and my parents told them what they found and he was pestering me. Do you feel this way? Do you have any feelings? And I just, I still to this day can remember being mortified, didn't say a word. I just said, I was curious. That's all it was. I didn't do anything. He asked me about masturbation, which I didn't, I thought was probably the first time I'd ever heard that word. And they didn't punish me or anything, but it was definitely a shameful you did the worst thing you possibly could don't ever do it again or you will be in trouble I, at that time i'm not even i might be in 12 12 13 at that time so do you know of anybody else in your congregation that may have identified as a member of this community group not that i'm aware of um and I'm, I'm a part of a kind of a, a Facebook group of ex-members as well. I will say that I don't want to mention any names for privacy sake, but I do have a very good friend that I keep in touch with. And uh, he is also very sexually fluid as well. And, right. But he, he was much smarter. He didn't cause as much trouble because if I didn't like something, I was going to say it. He just did it and never got caught. Um, and uh, he's probably one of my best friends in the world but even then he was able to suppress it and not um have anybody find out whereas I obviously didn't care didn't wasn't wasn't trying to hide anything and got caught and if there were people that were to identify with this community group do you think they would most likely keep it to themselves anyway oh gosh yes because if it depends on what it if they within themselves know 100 percent i am i am lbgtq and wanted to stay in this cult they would have to hide it because if they wanted to stay in this cult inside they know that they probably feel like they're just sin and they would probably tell a minister and they would probably have to be suspended because that's how the mindset is is programmed in this cult. If you think that you have sinned, I mean, at that PYC camp, they even asked us, if you're masturbating, you need to repent and talk to a minister. So you're conditioned that if you have an internal issue, like, or a conflicting issue, that you need to speak to a minister about it. So um, I don't think that they would have internalized it. I think that they would have been vocal about it because in their mind that's admitting to the minister that they're full of sin and they want to get rid of it is how I would right. how I would perceive it from okay. the conditioning of myself and you mentioned a little bit about the there being a um a, a college as well yes is it's, this is this where people can go to actually obtain a formal education it's not formal it is an unaccredited school and only cult members are allowed it has no accreditation towards any kind of degree whatsoever it's just a certificate that says you completed a four-year liberal college that has no certain degree and all three of my sisters went there right and And have graduated and 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 what have they graduated in 
oh, it liberal, liberal. The only thing is it's liberal arts because it's a religious cult school. They can't say that they have anything. It's not an actual college. It's and not people Yale. Who, it's not. They have to attend, they have to pay to attend this course. Yes. Okay. So. I know, how, I know. <laughs> how does the, how does the, how does the funding work? Are you, is tithing encouraged or are you asked to go out and tithe. fundraise? Right. Okay. Okay. So, and 20%, both. So, that's, that's a hefty number. That's every, so how I understood it for my education is, so they did do fundraising. They would do these call things. They would sell gift baskets, much like kids do here in elementary school to get a new playground or something like that. The cult did encourage those kind of fundraising. The other thing is tithing. Um, 10% goes immediately to the church. The other 10% goes towards your um, second tithe, which is called your fund for the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, it's actually around the corner, um, is a seven-day cult festival where members from all over the world gather in certain parts of the country and every day they go to services and they're supposed to give offerings and pay for hotels and basically have a lavish week living outside of their means. So 10% out of everything you make is supposed to go to that week festival. Then every three years, you're supposed to do 30%. And that third tithe is also supposed to give back to the cult. So every year, 10% of your money goes to the cult. And then every third year, 20% goes to the cult. And I mean, uh, uh, are you expected to do this from your very first job? Yep, they tried to make me do that and I didn't. Okay, so what age were you when you, when you got your first job and, and what job was it? Uh, I was 15 and I was a swim instructor for, um, do they have y YMCAs in England? Yeah, yeah. So I was a swim instructor um, for little kids out of the local YMCA. And I think my first check was $180 and they said, you need to send 18 of it to the church. And I wrote the check. I, sh I made them happy, wrote the check and I was going upstairs to get an envelope and I just ripped it up and never, ever, ever, they've never once got my penny. And was, it, was there any backlash from, for you from, from doing this? No, because my parents were not um, doing that themselves. So okay. there, yeah. so there was that sense of hypocrisy. At one point I was the only person employed in my, my home. Both of my parents didn't have jobs and I was the only one working a job. Okay. So they were both living off of um, unemployment. And you mentioned, were, you mentioned briefly before um, about how people are almost vetted before they're asked to come along to, you know, one of the services. Mm -hmm. Is this the main method of recruitment or are there different ways that the, that the church will try to bring in new members? Oh, that's the only way they have to go. The minister has to sign off on you to attend services because the last thing they want, say, for instance, if they came to talk to me and I knew all the quims and qualms of what I needed to say to get into this cult, they don't want somebody bursting into their congregation, making a fuss. They don't want somebody raising uh, eyebrows and uh, not fitting in uh, with everyone else. You, they have to go through this vetting process in order to make sure that they're going to be complicit, compliant with how the church operates. Because the second, for instance, why they have to smash those CDs is because if you are getting, go into the church and you hear something radical, like they have on their minute sermons and sermonettes, they, they don't want you to, to leave. They want to put you in slowly, 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 slowly. For instance, right. they have extremely racist policies. Um, oh, right. Okay. People. Yeah. If we want to get into that, cause that's my main thing is I really yeah. hope that, that people, especially with black lives Ma uh, matter in, here in the States, that is a huge thing, um, that I want to, them to know about this cult is they have a separation of race policy and you can even watch, they have a YouTube channel where they have musicals that they put on. And in one scene, all these children are on stage. And they're all different ages, all different, I mean, girls, boys, teenagers, toddlers, they're all on the stage and they're all going to this one character and they're all hugging him, except for the three black children. 
He right. shakes their hand. He shakes their hand. In this, in, at summer camp, I had uh, one other teenager in my congregation, and he was a black man, and he couldn't dance with me. He couldn't escort me from one place to another. You need to be escorted from building to building and, as being a woman, and it, it, it couldn't be a black guy. And I felt so bad because there were two Indian boys at summer camp and only one Indian girl. So both boys had to pick, take turns dancing with the one girl. Same for Latinos, same for any race. If you cannot prove that you come from a white um, or Spanish background, now I know people with um, Latino Spanish background, European Spanish backgrounds that were able to marry white people because they were able to prove that they came from Europe. And they had to show their lineage to the ministers in order to do that. It's that disgusting. And is that is it blatantly obvious when you become a, a member of the church that, that these are the policies that they hold? If it's not been already instructed to you. I, um, being that I'm white, I don't know what they told um, black people, people of color when they joined. Um, I actually never saw, I, don't, I only remember seeing two members into my congregation being added and they were both white families. I never saw uh, somebody of color coming in indoctrinated. So I don't know what they say to them, but I, I know that at camp and at, they're not allowed to get married. You can't marry a black person. If I'm white, you have to marry within your own race. And they, oh, I'm trying to remember, I think it's the Tower of Babylon where God made everybody different languages, that that's where you're supposed to stay in your own lane. So black people could only dance with black people, Latino with Latino people, Indian, white. And of course, the cult is a majority of white person. Um, now, I will say that my stepfather, being the jokester that he is, wanted to learn about this cult and found in one of the books that God's people and then quote unquote white people and then the rest of the book goes on. So they definitely hold white people to the godly standard as far as their teaching goes. And I mean, if they have these sort of thoughts and restrictions around race and restrictions around sexuality and restrictions around women's rights uh, and, and kosher diets, uh, is there anything, I mean, you've, you've spoken a little bit about being expected to dress modestly um, um, and alcohol sort of being not, not something that is restricted in its entirety. Is there anything else you can think of that was just, you know, not encouraged within the church? Um, voting, but I heard that's also been suspended oh, because right? they've really, really embraced Trump for some reason. Course, yeah. I don't know. I couldn't know why. But <laughs> um, from what I understand, they don't encourage voting because God's government is the only government that matters. Um, definitely anti um pro-choice, um, always going to be pro-life. That's not even up for debate. Uh, trying to think pro-life, uh, couldn't do anything on Saturdays, not allowed to join the military. Um, God's war is going to be the end time. So you don't need to sign up for the military. And also you can't observe and you can't tithe if you're in the military and active duty. Um, basically anything like we like said for Christmas, like you don't buy presents, and birthdays, you don't buy presents, anything to restrict outward spending. So that way more money was spent to the cult. And I'm trying to think of it, go ahead. You, you mentioned uh, before about people becoming excommunicated. Can you think of any examples of times people within your church did get excommunicated and, and the reasons behind it? Or can you give us some examples of why somebody might be excommunicated completely from the church? Um, I'm trying to think. Just because I don't want to tell anybody's stories because I don't know the whole truth and what the other person's perspective. Um, I know for the most part, teenagers just leave because they're done. Um, that was a huge issue is that kids were leaving because that second generation, like we were talking about, wasn't going to happen. This first generation of kids born, being born in the cult really, really has evaporated. Um, I'm trying to think as far as 
people leaving. Um, I had a, a very good friend um, in my congregation who uh, was in a very large family like mine, and she was one of my best friends, and their family just left. And I don't know why, and I don't know what happened, but I mean, for a five or six year old to have your best friend leave and you're you can't say anything you don't know where they are you don't have a number your parents don't let you call them um and the most tragic thing was i think three years later her father died and my parents were really debating on because the ministry was going to let us go to the funeral the ministry if an ex-member dies um they will let you know if you can go to the the funeral or not and the ministry had said that we were allowed to attend the funeral if we wanted to and my parents decided not to and it was heartbreaking because so I just wanted to see my best friend of um, course yeah I'm trying to think a lot of uh, reasons I, I've uh, one incident I know is that single men um, men of divorce who then join the cult or um, just single men in general have the hardest time um staying in the church because they wanted to get married but they couldn't find partners and so go ahead um so you you mentioned there about the ministry making decisions and, and you've said um a little bit about that before as well in terms of you know what they expected from you when you got your first job are you did you have plans for further education and if you did were you supposed to run it past them i know it's very patriarchal and um, you know, I, I assume that it's kind of more encouraged for men to go and um, and obtain further education or for you to pay to go to the specific college that, you know, to get your liberal arts qualification. Mm -hmm. But so for, for women, not not at all. Women, I mean, the only college that they supported was their own as far as further education. I mean, they couldn't be doctors. Uh, that's another thing is that they're um their health and their medical doctrine i was never vaccinated they are very anti-vaccination right um, I, have you been vaccinated now i have been vaccinated okay I'm still okay for that autism to kick in but it hasn't okay been. yeah <laughs> i it's um i got chicken pox my freshman year of high school and it was the most severe case anybody that saw pictures had seen i was covered from head to toe you're supposed to get chicken pox when you're a child, four, five, six. And for a 14-year-old, 15-year-old to get it, it was the worst thing in the world. Um, I, I was gone for two weeks. It's, they don't encourage enlightenment. That's the word I want to use. You are only supposed to grow within the cult. You are only supposed to um, do things that will help the cult. Now, you can go off and be a, a mechanic or a warehouse worker but they were not encouraged to get master's degrees um bachelor degrees you were supposed to go to the cult church which is named after herbert w armstrong go to the cult college graduate from there whether it be the two-year program or the four-year program that's another thing is that you go for two years and then they thin the herd to think who would be who's fit to go on for another two years so they have a vetting program within their own college to make sure that they have the most dedicated, the most brainwashed, the ones who are going to do anything for this cult to further on in their education in the cult. And it, it, it's not, education is not um, held up. It's only there to support the cult and to give more money to the cult. Right. Okay. And so do you see your sisters now? Do you speak to them? Even though, because if you weren't baptized and not officially excommunicated, do you have the opportunity to have contact with your sisters? And, you know, what's the relationship like now with you and your father? Um, so my sisters, I have not spoken to since my wedding in April of last year. Um, there has been a few text messages, but overall they have completely cut me out. Um, probably for this reason right here, because I'm, I'm talking about the cult. I'm talking, uh, that's another uh, reason to get excommunicated. Like I, I have been, it's because I have reached out to so many people that are involved in their community and um, their publicists, their um, news articles, uh, local newspapers that publish things that go on at their auditorium. I have reached out to every single one and let them know about my experience in, inside the PCG. 
And obviously that's gotten back to my family. And now my sisters don't speak to me. Um, as for my father, I haven't spoken to him in six years. And you don't, and that's, that's, that's not a pure choice. Do you see that changing in the near future? Or do you think the only way that, that, there can be true change in the relationships between you and your immediate family would be if they were to also walk away from the church. 100% they have to walk away. Um, for my own mental health, for my marriage, for my family, I do not want them involved. Um, for instance, if I could put an example, if I have children, I'm not telling them that they have aunts unless they're out of the church. It's just, it's not fair um, to me to have to put up with what they believe in because they're all adults they see how happy my mom and dad or my mom and I are my father two of them live with my father in a small apartment that 15 minutes down the street from where I actually live they're 15 minutes away from me and I haven't spoken to them in a year my other sister she's located still at headquarters in Edmond Oklahoma and it's it's one of those things where they're my sisters I'm going to love them I have so many fond memories of them but unfortunately, this is the life they've chosen. Um, they didn't even invite my mom to her wedding, my sister. She didn't invite me. Um, I invited her to my wedding, even though I hadn't spoken to her in two years before then. But, and they came to my wedding, but they didn't invite my mom to hers. And she didn't invite me. And so, that's, that, that's where we stand. And my family was very hurt by that. My family, none, no one in my family other than my father went to my sister's wedding. My sisters and my father were the only ones that were at my sister's wedding. And how did that, did your mom ever speak to you about how that felt for her? No, oh, it's heartbreaking. It's your daughter. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, I mean, that's why I, I wanted to make sure she was fully involved in mine because I know that's, that's what's going to happen. That's, that's our future is that. Mm -hmm. we are not their family it's very very much known to us and told to us that the cult is more important to them than us and it's the same mindset that my mom's family had um before she left that this cult was more important to her than her family so you mentioned at this very start before we pressed the record button that you just come from your house because it's a bit noisier in your home to your mum's mm -hmm. house and cooked breakfast and had a mimosa and and uh <laughs> and a catch up with your mum and and now we're sitting here talking so you you're obviously you know very close with your mum you, if you you know can drive to her house from yours you obviously you, you must live close to each other and mm -hmm. you live in your home with your dog and your husband so I live with my husband, my dog, and then I live with my father's mother and brother. Um, my father's mother is getting up there in age, and my uh, uncle is autistic. So basically, we've moved in as kind of uh, house, not housekeepers, but caregivers yeah. for them. Yeah. And, and it's wonderful. We, it's a big house. We have plenty of room. I cook dinner every night. They have their shows. We have our shows. It's probably the best way to to live at this moment with with COVID and everything yeah. I don't I don't need her out and about I don't need him out and about it's and it's sad because I'm the grandchild and I'm the one that's having to take care of my grandmother and my uncle because my father is, isn't trustworthy enough and you and your husband is he religious at all no he he grew up um in, in the, the south Georgia which is very what we would call the bible belt so he grew up with a, a very religious influence, but not um, not nearly. It, it would be what I can call a, a a regular Christian upbringing. It wasn't crazy. Just went to church on Saturday or Sundays and Wednesdays, Bible study, and that was that. And are you able to speak to him freely and openly about all of these experiences, and sort of have him as a as a person on the outside to to kind of talk through? everything and and kind of sort it all out oh yeah he he is my rock when it comes to um trying to set boundaries with my sisters with my father and sometimes with my mother just because everything has been so blended with trauma and the cult and he is the ultimate person that i can speak freely about these experiences and he's was so happy when you reached out he goes I'm, this is one thing that you've always wanted he's so encouraging he 
uh, the one thing I feel for him is if if you're if if for instance if your husband said this is how I grew up and these things happened to me much like I just told you the story of what my father did to me and and how you reacted in horror imagine that being now your father-in-law yeah yeah absolutely and not only that but having to um having to almost imagine that sort of a, a pain and abuse being inflicted on the person that you know you you love and the person that you want to marry and spend your life with that must be mm-hmm. very difficult um yeah i couldn't imagine he would ever want to sit around the dinner table with your father no and, and um, i and i have never subjugated him to that and yeah, i never yeah. will but it, it it's still one of those things that uh, if something were to ever happen um to your husband or or to anybody you love you would yeah. want to seek vengeance in in yeah. any sort of way and that's that's unfortunately that's nothing we can do it's nothing we can act on but we can still wish ill will on people who hurt the ones we love and it's it's not fair to him in any way but he is so supportive in what we do what we take care of he he's helped me phenomenally stepping up as helping me to be a caregiver to my mother, my father's mother and his brother and where he can't be and he won't be. So he's really taken on that, that, that leadership role, that son role in our family. That's great. That isn't it. That's, I mean, that's another thing I think in terms of, um, you recommended therapy for people that are going through similar situations. Um, and I think, um, an, another almost underrated probably um help is just having somebody neutral that you can sit down and talk to who will just listen with without judgment to you know your experiences your thoughts and almost just kind of let you speak and just kind of like word vomit just let loose everything yeah. i was gonna say that word vomit. Yeah, word vomit everything that comes to your mind and the thoughts, feelings, emotions, you know, and things that you've probably blanked out that you might remember as you go through opening up and talking. It's just about having somebody who you trust 100%, who you know is not going to judge you or ever use any of the information against you, which is also something that unfortunately seems to happen all too much in, in these movements. And so find that person. I think that's, I think that's Absolutely. important, isn't it? And Find it that person. And it doesn't have to be a, a lover or, or anybody that you're intimate with. I mean, I, I have best friends who I've known um, throughout this whole process. She met me right before I started going through uh, leaving this cult. And I, I would turn to her shoulder any day because of the support she's given me. See, we met in Fort. So I've known her for 13 years. And you, you need to find somebody who is going to give you, um, cause what it is, is what, what we are missing these, uh, speaking for my survivor self is that unconditional love. Find someone who will give you that unconditional love and that hearing I'm so apart, I'm getting emotional <laughs> <okay>. that will, <laughs> that will give you that love that will give you that stimulation of you are worthy and you have a story to tell and tell your story. Don't yeah, be ashamed. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, it's, it's very I, brave <laughs> to sit down and talk, talk about your story as well and experiences because I mean, ab- abuse is very difficult to talk about. And a lot of the time it goes, it goes unspoken because it's mm-hmm. still taboo for some absurd reason. It's still, you know, it's, it's almost, yeah, yeah, it's almost for some people embarrassing to talk about because you don't want to admit that these things have happened to you. Uh, I think a lot of people think that it, it portrays them in a, in a, in some type of, as some type of weak person. Um, no. um yeah, that's one thing you are not weak. That is not. absolute. No, I, I think it's the opposite. Yeah, Come forward and exactly. tell your story. That's the opposite of weakness to, you know, and not only that, you know, you're taking some power back as well because you can sit here and you can tell your side of the story and know that you are listened to without judgment. And, you might have, you know, not, not you specifically, but a lot of people that, that come to, to speak with me or anybody, you know, even if it's just their 
partner or best friend that they're sitting on the couch talking to. You know, a lot of people might not have had the experiences of just be just being listened to and being able to tell their story and just and and their story in a way that's not it's not edited it or embellished. It, it's not mm. telling a story because it's the way you think somebody wants to hear it. It's not you mm. telling a story for the benefit of somebody else because it makes them look good in, in light of the church or, or any of these things. So, you know, I think the power of spoken word, especially when it's your spoken word, is so powerful. So, yeah, it, I mean, talking about your experiences is the opposite of weakness. It's, it's, it's powerful. It's brave. You're taking back ownership of your narrative and your story so I think that people should definitely talk and it's definitely that shame that people don't that oh this happened to me and I can't let anybody know no you need to let people know people need to know that this shit still exists it's not like this is 1800s anymore and there's snake oil no cults are very very much alive very much Mm -hmm. still thriving Mm -hmm. and people don't know People don't know because people don't talk about it. Pe- victims stay silent because they're ashamed or they want to. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I will attest that some people just want to forget. And yeah. I get that. I want to forget every single day about the childhood that I had and the things that I had to experience so young when I didn't need to. I didn't have to. But because the choices that were made for me by my parents, mm-hmm. unfortunately, that's what happened. And some of those choices are out of your hands. But the thing that you do need to do for yourself is acknowledge that it happened. Because to deny it is worse. Acknowledge that it happened and take back your power. Yeah. However yeah. that may be. Uh, this this is the ultimate power for me right now. <laughs> I yeah. feel, so, uh, encouraged. Yeah, I feel so encouraged. I'm so excited to get the feedback and the hope that that whoever's listening out there knows that people care. I care. I want people who have experienced the same thing that I have to go out and say, Oh, I'm not alone. I I can feel better. I can be happy. Or those who are still in cults and I mean, Jehovah's witnesses, Mormons, whatever your sect is that you're not alone and you don't have to do anything because a God told you to. That's not how a God works. It isn't. And it isn't. That's what I was thinking earlier when you ex- were talking about the, you know, the horrible things with your father. I, I just don't understand how, you know, I can, can almost, I can almost understand why somebody might use a cat of nine tails to purify them of, you know, if they'd had untoward thoughts or, or felt themselves wandering whether but that's, that's you know looking at the book looking at the first Harry Potter book and wondering if you should read it or not and then deciding that you're having impure thoughts so you're going to purify mm-hmm. yourself with a cat of nine tails I mean I don't really get that but I can almost see how you could mm-hmm. rationalize it but beating your child to that extent I don't understand how you could say that you are doing that for God and you're doing that for your child and you're doing that to save your child and to purify your child and to make sure that I just don't, I don't understand it. I mean, uh, delusion. I delusion. And, and I will say that there was, uh, my, I, yeah, my, just, my sister told my mother that my father told her that the reason my mother and I left is because my father was too soft on us wow now i don't know if you heard the exact same thing i <laughs> i told you earlier that does sound like delusion. that that's that wasn't soft that's, he wasn't oof. too soft that's no. delusion. and 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 give it that my father is my father and that he took whatever liberties and whatever doctrine to the extreme but without the philadelphia church of god and gerald flurry and stephen flurry and the bullshit that they put out my father might have not done the things he did to me, but the fact that the church encouraged corporal punishment, encouraged banking, encouraged for the men to be the leadership of the house and to be uh, dictators to their wives and to their children is 100% what led to the abuse mm. that I, I experienced. I mean, you mentioned before about covid and and you know the house that you're in now is probably the perfect situation because of this pandemic how mm-hmm. do you think this the, how do you think the philadelphia church of god is faring during covid do you think they're using 
um, this pandemic to further their narrative and, um, you know, and their message about the end of times? Or do you think that a few people may have been able to have a bit of a break from, you know, meeting every Saturday and, and actually think to themselves that it's not really for them anymore? That's, that's a little, that's a little hard. Um, just cause, uh, uh, unfortunately they've blocked me from most of their Twitter accounts. So I'm no longer available to see that kind of information just because of the comments I've left on their accounts. <laughs> um, proud of it, but, <laughs> um, if I, if I could speak freely and, and kind of think on it, if I would say that they are using it for both. One, they're using it to instill fear, fear, but not in the sense that it's an actual disease, but that it's the Democrats making up lies so that way uh, their narrative is full Trump. So whatever Fox News is putting on, put a religious spin on it, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, as far as the medical and social distancing and everything, I highly doubt that they're doing any of that. Now, there might be some suspensions of church, but in all honesty, they believe that God heals all. Um, I remember um, I had, I've, I've had issues with my tonsils since I was a child uh, to the point where I would wake up and I couldn't breathe because they were so big and swollen. Gosh. And, and doctors tried to give, I, I went to a doctor because I was so hard for me to breathe. And they gave my mom the prescription for amoxicillin and, and a throat spray. And she didn't even fill the prescription because God was going to heal me because they were going to get, they have anointing cloths that they'll send out to members from ministers. And you're supposed to put the anointing cloth that's full of olive oil or whatever on your head and pray. Mm. They did that probably 14 times to my tonsils never worked I finally I mean, finally got them removed and I feel so much better and they refused to let me get them removed because it was a part of my body and that was a surgeon and it's unnecessary is, is that the they, same with blood transfusions as well because I, I know that the Jehovah's Witnesses are um they forbid blood transfusions but I mean, it's, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Because science has come such a long way and it's almost mm -hmm. disputable, but then there are still parts of religion that will say, mm -hmm. you know, well, it goes against God. But exactly. I mean, um, it, as far as the blood, I don't, I, they're not that severe because I know that people have definitely had surgeries and, and things that were, uh, I would say, pertinently life threatening. Um, heart attacks, uh, car accidents, mm -hmm. things of that nature. That's not something that the church would be refuse right. medical attention, um, a broken arm, things of that nature. Cancer, um, medical inflictions. Um, I'll actually give you an example of my father. Um, my father got um, basically a, a form of elephantitis in his leg because right. something got into a cut in his leg. And my grandparents, even though he didn't have insurance, took him to a doctor, paid for the doctor, got all the prescriptions so that way they could clear the infection. And my father looks at the doctor and says, I'm not taking those. So the oh, doctor gosh. still gives the pills. Oh, it gets better. Gives the pills to my grandparents, insists that he sit in a wheelchair and he rolls him out to the wheel to my grandparents' truck, puts him in the truck, looks him in the eye puts the wheelchair in the back of the truck and says, you're going to need that for the rest of your life if you don't make take those pills. And you know what? He still has a bum leg because he refused to take no. those pills. The lymph nodes are dead because he refused to take the oh pills. It was goodness. a simple infection. And he refused to take the pills because he thought he knew more than the doctor looking at them. But you know what? You pay for you But they say they that stuff. you can't they say, you know, God will heal me, but if he still has a bum leg, then that's not the case, is it? Yeah, but that's a delusion. Oh my goodness. So you've, you've spoken that you're, you're receiving EMDR therapy now, um, trauma mm -hmm. therapy, um, mm -hmm. and, and you have an actual therapist that, has, that, that can specialize in religious trauma specifically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what has your life been like since, since attending this therapy? Is it, do you think it's, it's helping you to kind of rebuild and, and kind of, um, 100%. Cope? 
100%. Um, so I obviously am not educated in, in therapies or any way, but how I understand EMD thera EMDR therapy to work is that you are reconnecting your brain. Your brain, when you are, is, is a roadway. When you are developing as a child, that's when those roadways are built. So for something like being severely beaten or screamed at for something so insolent, that sticks with you. And those fight or flight reactions stick with you. And I was at a point where within my job, I was getting um, authority, um, disciplinary actions because I kept being so aggressive at my workplace. And I didn't understand that. I fully did not recognize that my actions were coming off as aggressive because my brain blocks everybody out. Mm -hmm. That's how it was wired. And uh, being in it in a year uh, before then, I think, I mean, I've sat here and cried to you twice today, <laughs> right? Before I started that therapy, it had been seven years since the last time I cried. I guess you're very desensitized and disassociated from feelings and thoughts and emotions. Because... Mm -hmm. Another thing is, is that when I left at 15, those were all my friends. I had no friends. The people that I went to school with weren't people that I could confide in because that's what the cult taught me. It's that they're yeah. the only people that you could be friends with is in the cult. And now I don't have the cult and I can't speak to these friends because they're not going to talk to me. Their parents aren't going to let them talk to me now that I'm out of the church, even though I hadn't done anything wrong. But that's it's it's that behavior and that yeah. overall if I do anything everybody will leave so if I just block everything nothing can happen and unfortunately that has affected me through adulthood to the point like I said I wouldn't even cry and she asked me and I hadn't even realized that it had been that long since I cried but you there are walls that we build that we don't know are built mm -hmm. and that's one thing that EMDR has really helped me realize is that these the, the shame and this over um, um the way I look at my body it's all because of the cult it's all how I was raised and that I don't need to feel like that there's no reason it's just the way that my brain connects and move through that therapy through MD, EMDR it's able to reconnect those those pathways so that way I don't yeah. have those immediate I'm gonna cut your throat if you talk to me in that kind of tone uh, reactions and it's helped my customer service and overall my relationships with family and friends. So you, we, we've spoken a little bit about recommendations for people in, in similar situations or advice for people in similar situations. We've spoken, you know, about therapy and talking to somebody that you trust. Um, just before um, I hand it over to you in case you think we've missed anything before we wrap up for the day. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any sort of online resources or anything that you can direct people towards if they were looking to just do sort of a little bit of online browsing before committing to something like therapy? Um, so with EMDR, you really do need a therapist. It's something, it's, it's not like um, hypnotism, but it's definitely something where you need an educated, guided person. It's not something that I would recommend you trying to do or look up an app and try to do it yourself. Please, please, please do not do that. This is a actual therapy that does help and to take it the wrong way can do damage that I don't even know how far it goes. Um, I would 100% look online uh, for those who are still involved in cults. Uh, just research your background. Find, ed find anything that's going to comfort you. For me, I found a Facebook group of ex-members of this cult who I, who I recognized, who were older uh, children that had just disappeared that I thought they had moved and nobody talked about. And I would find them and have those reconnections because they knew my dad or they remembered me from a kid. Reach out to that community because that community will help you the most because they're the ones that that no. Um, for instance, I talked about my, my male friend who's a little gender uh, sexually fluid. He was the person that's, I mean, he, he has saved me from so many low points because there's no one in the world that's going to know your experience. Um, you, you and I have talked all this time, but for, for him, he knows because he was there. 
so I can have these conversations and, mm-hmm. and, and, and it's, it's relatable. Find something relatable, whether it, it, maybe it's such a small cult that you don't have ex members, find somebody, something that you can relate to and uh, indulge. Um, for me, how you found me was through Reddit. Um, our cults, uh, there's mm-hmm. so much information out there uh, about people finding things and um, I think a post the other day was finding stuff from Jonestown mm-hmm. articles and people are yeah. really getting interested in this. People, people oh, will I... post things on there as well. Like think my uncle's in a cult. Can you help? And there'll be sort of 10 responses within the first hour of just people putting different links for, for you know, that specific story um, different exactly. links and resources that might be helpful. So I always refer people back to Reddit um, during these podcast episodes. Um, and, an- and another thing is if you're interested in learning more about the worldwide church of God, um, it's not obviously haunted is mostly about ghost stories haunted on Netflix, but there is an episode on season two called cult of torture that talks about the worldwide church of God and a gentleman, a gay gentleman's experience with growing up in the worldwide. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So I, I've, I've reached out to them as well. Um, obviously, I didn't have any uh, ghost stories for them, but they, they've taken my information and they said if they do anything like fully related to cults that they would 100% reach out. But the Worldwide Church of God is featured in the cult of Torjo. And for oh, me, to go and watch. watching, oh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, for me, we also watched... Herbert W. Armstrong's programs. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was called Worldwide. Or, uh, oh, I can't remember the also name. Also a TV actor. Also a TV actor. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but his, his his televangelist program. Um, my parents would also make us watch. If we didn't go to church, they would make us watch recordings. We had DVDs of it. And in the beginning of the episode, it plays the theme music, and it's almost as if Oh, like if you were scared of dogs, a dog barking behind you, it was uh, a jump scare almost. Are you kidding me? Are you, it, it didn't feel real that something that was so close to home and so small and so unrecognizable to the public is now on a Netflix show. They must have consulted with ex-members to get it that accurate then. Oh, he's on it. The, the, there's a, a, the, how that TV show is set up is that you have, um, uh, somebody sitting in a room with other people, relatives who experience it. And right, I, right. I, he, he, he now follows me on Twitter, the same guy. I, can't oh. remember his name. I don't have it all on me, but the producer from the show, the guy who's uh, involved in the show, um, who, who tells a story, they both started following me on Twitter and it's, it's, I think it's James Swift name's James Swift if my my photographic memory is correct and it's it's heartbreaking what his story is um I wouldn't wish that on any child um it's far worse than anything I've told you today but uh, to see him as a grown man to to advocate and to tell his story I I only want to be like that and to tell people how awful manipulation brainwashing and how you the only person that you need to trust is yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've gone through all of my points. So was there anything you think we've missed or anything you'd like to add? I'm trying to think of how top of my head. I, it's just cults are bad. Don't be in cults. Leave your cult. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main thing um, to anybody out there who's uh, suffering from physical abuse, verbal abuse, mental abuse, um, please reach out. There's so many programs here in America, there in England that um, you can reach out to. Um, safe words, whatever you need. If you need help, please, please, please let us know. Um, let anybody know. Um, try to think of anything else. Top of my head. Um, this has just been so fun. I feel like I've just went through another therapy session that's weighed off of my shoulders. I'm I'm glad to. Let I've people found know. this very interesting. I'm I'm really <laughs> looking forward to to being able to to share this with um with my listeners, especially because um it I feel like it's really um encouraging when somebody comes to speak about their experiences and talks about you know being in a in a really bad place and the steps that they've been able to take to get to a much 
better place and have a much more positive outlook. And I think that must be so encouraging for people that feel like they have no options, that feel like they're never, you know, going to be able to recover from from their situations. And I just think, I just think you've you've spoken so eloquently and so openly about your experiences, you know, and you've 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 given people a real heartfelt insight into your life and you know and and hopefully given people uh, you know some some, some hope (laughs) yeah but it's true isn't it i mean you're you're very optimistic now and and i think maybe you're you're just giving people some hope on on how their situations can improve or just to know that they're not on their own and there are empathetic people in the world that will Mm. care about your stories and experiences like you said unconditionally and I think that's great so I mean I've really appreciated your time today and I I can't say thank you enough really for for trusting me with your story and coming to speak with me today and and just let me be a a little part of your journey um you put it out there you you've given me that platform to to tell my story and for that I mean I applaud you you're you're giving people I mean speaking from experience there was a point where there was no hope there was no there was no light no light in my life no light anywhere and to make sure that anybody who's also sitting in that perspective of I'm alone I now have nobody I don't know what to do you always have options that's you said that and that's one of my big things with my therapist is I didn't have options in a cold Mm -hmm. there's it's, it's either this or death and that was what it felt like Mm-hmm. And there are always options, no matter what, whether it's, whether it's political or religious or uh, in a relationship mm-hmm. or every day, you have options. You don't need to do the same thing yeah. you did yesterday. That's it'd I think be crazy that's, if you yeah. did. I think that's right. I think you've summed it up perfectly. I mean, another survivor I was speaking to the other day said that, you know, never underestimate the power of doubt. If you have a, even the smallest, tiniest seed of doubt never disregard it, never ignore it, never think that, you know, it's just you being silly, you know, don't gaslight yourself into thinking that, um, you know, you, your doubt human. is bad. It's a, yeah, it's a powerful thing in it, isn't it doubt? So um, I think that's another thing as well. Just trust, trust your instincts and just know that there are people that, that genuinely want to sit down and talk and listen. So, um, so I'm going to end the call there. And I just wanted to say such a huge thank you. I mean, you should, talk you know go to your mum and tell her that um she's wonderful (laughs) give her a hug tell her she's wonderful go to your husband tell him he's wonderful um and I just hope that you have like a a lovely glorious day and um just thank you so much for for speaking with me no absolutely thank you so much and you enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again for giving me the platform and to giving other people hope it's been my privilege hannah i will be in touch with you very soon take care you too thank you so much bye Bye. that is the end of this week's episode if you would like to get in touch you can find me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on twitter and instagram at cultvaultpod i'm your speaker casey and this has been the cult vault